Okay. Hi, excuse me if I just bumped my face into your screen. My name is Shia Rarbeck, and I'm going to spend the next hour talking to you about great nutrition and nutrition for children and also nutrition for families. And um, as you can see, looking at my first slide, oh, by the way, I'm Director of Nutrition at the Mailman Center for Child Development, and I work with children and their families. I work with um, all children, a lot of different diagnoses, a lot of kids are just looking to eat healthier, families who want to know how to improve the nutrition for the family. So I work with a lot of different um, situations. And one theme that you're going to be seeing throughout my presentation is the, ti the title here, Food is the Best Medicine, and I really believe that. And the longer I'm in practice as a nutritionist, the more I believe that. And unfortunately, in the 30 years that I've been a nutritionist, I've seen people moving away from food. And one might say, well, that seems a little strange because everyone has kept eating and even people have become more overweight. And what I mean is real natural foods. And while I was waiting to come here to do this presentation, I had an example of this just hit me in the face in the waiting room. There was a child there who I guess had just had, a, who had, just had an appointment here and he came back to the waiting room and he was given a bag of uh, like cheese at crackers. And in my worldview, cheese at crackers I would call not a real food. They are very high in sodium, um, they're high in added fats, and the nutritional value is pretty poor. And in my world, I would love to see a child, when they're meeting up with their parent, be given a piece of fruit, be given an orange or an apple or a bag of baby carrots, um, something else. And I think that's going to be a theme that you're going to see going through my presentation. And for this live recording, if anyone has any questions, please type them in. And you don't have to wait till the end of the presentation. I will. Um, answer them as soon as the question comes up. So this is all about food. Food is the best medicine. And I think we could get our health of ourselves and our children back on track if we keep just that one message in mind. So I'm going to advance. And what's happened is, and it's really interesting, there's always a pendulum and things you know, they like if someone thinks about fashion and they go put it in your closet and sooner or later it'll come back in fashion. And it's sort of the same thing with food now. Food has come back in fashion. And I would say up, and I have some examples of this, but up until about, let's say, 1920s or 30s, everyone ate real food. And then with modernization and techniques for freezing and, and industrial canning, we moved more towards um, processing food, but also what happened, and this happened in about the 70s, we started talking about nutrition, and people were given the message, eat less saturated fat, eat less cholesterol, eat less sodium. So the foods that we were eating that were processed started being manipulated to meet these nutrition guidelines, and people sort of moved away from eating healthy foods. We were eating nutrients, like someone would eat something and go, how much cholesterol does it have? Or how much sodium does it have? So we moved into the world of nutrition, and not saying that nutrition is not important. I'm a nutritionist, so obviously I think it's very important. But we, we moved away from thinking about food as something delicious, nutritious, and able to give us more than just preventing vitamin deficiencies, the ability to prevent chronic disease. And now the pendulum is moving back towards food. There's um, Food Network is very popular. I would think, I see, I counsel a lot of children every week, and so many of them enjoy watching the Food Network. I'm always surprised, I'll say to a child when I'm seeing them in a session, and who's your favorite chef? And, often, and they always have someone, they really enjoy it. And What's, what we need to move, though, some people have said that people cooking has become a spectator sport because people are getting takeout and watching the Food Network, and we want to change that. And that would also be one of my messages today, to get in the kitchen, because people who eat the healthiest are people who are cooking. So the pendulum went from food 
to nutrition, worried about saturated fat, cholesterol, sodium. Now it's back to food. And again, cholesterol, sodium, saturated fat are important. But when you're eating fruits and vegetables, you don't even have to think about those things because they don't occur in foods that grow from the ground. Foods that grow have no cholesterol, have very little sodium, and would have very, very little saturated fat. The only thing I can think of that grows that's high in saturated fat is coconuts. So eat natural food. You don't have to think about nutrition. It, ha it occurs just deliciously and naturally. Oops, I'm so sorry. And this just epitomizes, you know, what I was saying. Try organic food, or as your grandparents called it, food. And you wonder why, and organic is another topic I'm not discussing, but there was no discussion of it because everyone, people were either growing their own food or everything was of a more natural leaning. So we, re and there's a, a famous food writer, he's called Michael Pollan, and he wrote Omnivore's Dilemma, Food Rules, his most recent book is Cooked. And he said, don't eat, and one of, he has all these different um, rules, let's say. And one of his rules is don't eat anything your grandmother wouldn't recognize. So um, that's sort of what he's talking about. You know, our grandparents or great-grandparents, depending on your age, they knew food, and they would be shocked, too, by some of the things they see today. Fruit leather. What is that? Did that grow somewhere? You know, that's kind of... They, they would recognize an orange and an apple and a banana, but they wouldn't recognize a gummy form of fruit, and they wouldn't most probably call it fruit. And just to take you back, I think this is such a fun picture, and I found this a while back. And this was the food that was eaten by a family in 1952. <clears throat> you can see that. It's eggs, and it's meat, and it's chicken, and it's milk, and it's flour, and it's sugar. Everything was cooked, most everything was cooked in the home. We weren't eating out so much. And then some people would say, oh, my, look at all the, the meat there, and look how much fat is on some of that meat. Well, also then, people ate very small portions. And so if you're eating four ounces of even a fattier kind of meat, it's okay. So that is something that the family ate for an entire year. So um, I guess then we could say it was about the early 50s when people stopped eating a diet that was more whole foods and started eating more foods that had been somewhat manipulated. And, excuse me, and here, this is my interpretation, is what dramatically changed our eating habits. And this was the beginning. And television happened in the um, early 50s that people really started getting a lot of TVs in the home. And so for television, they developed those little tables that they called TV tables. And it took a family away from the family dining room and eating together and talking to each other and put people in front of a television set eating off of a little um, table, even developed food. At that time, that's what they developed. It was called a TV dinner. Now we call them frozen meals, but it was a TV dinner. It was food that you were meant to eat while watching TV. So here's another one of my important points. It is so beneficial to a child and to the family to sit down together at the dinner table and eat together and talk to each other. That, and there is research that shows that children who sit and eat with their family have less dropout rates from school. They certainly have improved nutrition and they have less drug use. Such a simple intervention to sit down at the table and eat together. And um, not blaming this all on television, but it was the beginning of moving away from the table. And so many families, when I'm doing um, counseling with a family, I always ask, where do you eat dinner? Who's at the table? Um, 
And then my recommendation usually is for everyone to sit down at the table and talk to each other. Now, for some families, that might not happen every night, but even adding on one or two nights a week, it will help. <clears throat> Excuse me. And too many kids are taking their meals into their rooms and either in front of a computer or in front of a TV set and eating on their own. And they're missing out on that wonderful interaction of family time. Um, and they're also, and what my next um, slide shows is they're also doing what I call mindless eating. And this is another contributor to um, a big problem we have in society today, which is overweight and obesity. When you're watching television, you are just, as these two little girls are doing, just sticking your hand in the popcorn bowl and eating. And this happens um, TV or computer. And mindless eating is, um, it's really, a, a, it, you know, you're also missing out on the deliciousness of food because when you're eating mindlessly, you are not tasting it, you might not be chewing enough, you're not really savoring the flavor. So eating at the table where everyone is talking to each other, you're sharing how your day was, all of these things move you away from mindless eating. And I've had patients who eat in bed. Um, and also another um, thing that I, I hope people can get away from is eating in the car. Because besides being mindless, it's also a bit dangerous. You know, now in the cars we eat, we text, um, people put on makeup. You know, we're, I think if we focus more on driving and eating at a table is really important. So mindless eating, just cutting out mindless eating. Just I advise my patients, sit at a table. Have your children sit at a table, you sit at a table, even if it's a snack. Child comes home from school, and, and now a lot of children are eating lunch around 11 o'clock. They get home from school around 3. They're very hungry. And I'll say, that's fine. Children need a snack. That's an important um time to offer some more nutrition. The snack being could be cheese and crackers, it could be my favorite apple and peanut butter, um, a nutritious snack. But even for the snack, sit down and eat, pay attention. Pay attention to what you're eating is absolutely a way to um, improve nutrition. So this I'm going to go through very quickly. And a lot of people talk about an obesity epidemic. And it's really shocking that these are slides from the Center for Disease Control. These are for adults, but I can tell you that the, um, the data, the information on children is exactly the same. And since the year 2000, our country has dramatically changed. Um, and I'm going to go through, and you can see from the last slide to this one, that there's one very dark orange state. I hope it's looking orange to you. Um, and as the states become more orange, it means a greater percentage of the population of that state is overweight or obese. And again, the numbers are exactly the same for children. So it is so rapid how um, people's bodies and weight are changing. So let me just, this is 2001. That's 2003, so you can see more orange states. Look at this, 2005, greater percentage of the population is overweight, obese. That's sort of um, the darkest um, state, which is Alabama, Louisiana. They have greater than 20, than 30% of their people overweight and obese. Greater than 30, I'm sorry, obese, not overweight, obese. Greater than 30% of the population is obese. Now you see the one blue state, which is Colorado, and that means that only 10 to 15 percent of the people in that state are obese. They're the only, only state. Here is 2007, 2008, 2009, and I have 2010. 2010, every orange state has greater than 
30, about 30% 30 of the people obese. And I didn't bring um, a picture of it along, but I also have a picture of the rise in diabetes in the United States. And that exactly mirrors the rise in obesity. And again, the numbers are the same for children. Now, I became a nutritionist 30 years ago, long time ago. And when I was in school studying nutrition, and we were learning about diabetes, it was called type 1, I'm sorry, it was called juvenile and adult onset diabetes. Juvenile was the type you, we usually saw um, a beginning of under 15, let's say, and those were um, kids who it's an autoimmune disease and needed to take insulin. Adult onset usually occurred with adults in their maybe 40s on up and um, often related to lifestyle and obesity. And these were people who would initially, um, you could say the, the younger one was an autoimmune disease and the adult onset from lifestyle was usually just the, you know, pancreas wearing out and cells becoming insulin, um, insulin resistant. And with those people, we usually start with them, the type twos with, I mean, the adult onset with medication and diet. Well, so I learned in school 30 years ago, juvenile and adult onset diabetes. When this obesity epidemic that I've shown you started, and so many children were becoming so obese, there was a huge number of children developing diabetes, and they changed the names to type 1 and type 2 because adult onset was not an accurate descriptor of what we were seeing. So I would say in my 30 years of practice at the University of Miami, the first 10 years, I never, ever saw a child with, as we call it now, type 2 diabetes, formerly adult onset. Now, every week, I see children um, who are diabetic or pre-diabetic, we call it. And um, it's frightening to me. It is frightening to me because there are so many complications related to uh, having diabetes. And also, I see a lot of children with special health care needs, as I, as I said at the beginning a whole range of special um, health care needs. It could be um, inherited disorders. It could be problems from a difficult birth. It could be acquired disorders. I see a lot of children on the autism spectrum. And having one disorder doesn't give you um, protection against having something else. So I see a lot of children who might have a diagnosis, and then their second diagnosis is now diabetes because of excessive weight. And there's just so many complications related to diabetes. And I think this is something we can prevent with the adoption of healthy eating and lifestyle habits very, as early as possible. So that is, and I, I sort of am going on about this because I see so much of it and I didn't see it my first 10 years of practice, and it's preventable. And so I think it's really important to put our energies into something we can prevent. And the prevention is, as I said, what is going to be my theme is food. The prevention is food, real food, families cooking, families eating together. That's the prevention of um, diabetes and, and many of the other chronic conditions that I'm seeing now with children. So what are the barriers? Because um, there are barriers to healthy eating, and I hear them from my patients all the time, and these are very real. And one is, oops, excuse me, one is time. We feel that we have so much to do in our lives, and grabbing a quick drive through meal is sometimes what a mom or a dad might feel is all they can do. And now this morning I gave the example when I was um, waiting to give this presentation, I saw a mom give the child a bag of Cheez-Its. And maybe that was bought from the vending machine here. But with a, just a little bit of pre-planning, you know, packing a banana comes in its own wrapper, um, is as easy as handing someone a bag of Cheez-Its. 
So yes, definitely time is a factor. And I work with a lot of families who go to drive through windows frequently. So for those families, it, you know, maybe the both maybe it's a single parent or both parents are working very long hours. I have given people instructions on the best thing to order or a better, you know, instead of some of the drive throughs um, to go to a place that would make a fresh sandwich. And always, I'll say, I understand if people have to do that a few days a week, but even if you do that, go home, put the food on the table, and eat together as a family. Now, I remember I was doing one counseling session, and the mom was telling me that they uh, go to a fried chicken place. And I said, um, how much of the, well, the little girl was eating the entire dinner in the back seat as mom was driving home. So there the simple solution was just don't give her, you know, or don't give the children the bag of food until you get home. So step one, eating at the, te you know, step one is going to a better choice of a drive through if that's all you have time for. Secondly, bring the food home and eat at the table, whatever you're eating, eat it mindfully. I've also given people, you know, some people now supermarkets are giving, um, having more prepared foods. And again, I understand the time constraints that this woman feels she's juggling, you know, home and work and business and just, you know, sometimes life feels like a juggling act. I've given people a good shopping list to, um, if you're going to a supermarket, please buy rotisserie chicken, buy a big bag of uh, frozen vegetables. I'm very big on frozen vegetables. Vegetables are frozen right from the field, so they always taste fresh. They always taste sweet. It's more economical than buying them um, fresh, you know, buying them in the produce section. And know that frozen vegetables, as I said, most of the growers have the plant that freezes them right on site. So you never have bad vegetables. You never have to throw something out that's gone bad. The other um, benefit of it is you, it, it's always there. So if you buy a rotisserie chicken and then just grab a handful of frozen broccoli or cauliflower or whatever ve mixed vegetable it is, you can microwave it. You have a dinner as quick as going through the drive through about 100 times healthier, and you're eating around the table, and you get to smell the food cooking, which is another great part of uh, eating at home. Another problem, we're talking about barriers to healthy eating, and we can't get away from the advertising and merchandising of products. And the fast food companies are trying to lure your children in, and they're doing a terrific job. And um, certain places are trying to outlaw these uh, toys and meals. And it's, it's a battle. And I think for a lot of kids, the first word they learn how to say is McDonald's. So um, it's important to put balance. And I'm not saying never eat a fast food meal, but keep it in perspective. Maybe it's once a month as opposed to, I, I had a patient who, um, it was a girl, and she was about 13, and she had spina bifida, and she was in a wheelchair, and we were talking about weight issues because she, since she had less um, mobility, she, it was, um, she gained weight more easily. So um, she, so from one appointment to the next appointment, I had, I was, I had a three-month follow-up, and she lost about 12 pounds, and I was feeling so proud and full of myself. Wow, did you follow my recommendations, and is that how you lost all that weight? And she said no. Her, um, her, she had an auntie living with her who was taking her to fast food three, four times a week. The auntie went back home, and no one was taking her to fast food, and that was the only change she made. She was just eating food from her house, and she lost 12 pounds. So it was nothing I said. It was, you know, a relative leaving the home and stopping going to the fast food. And a fast food meal of a cheeseburger and fries and a drink could be over 1,000 calories. And we're talking about a child who maybe their whole recommended intake is 15, 1,600 calories a day, and that one meal is giving them over, you know, two-thirds of what they should eat for the day. Also, the salt, the sodium content is above what they should have in an entire day. So this is a barrier. It's a barrier um, because of their marketing, their appeal to children, and it's something that parents 
Um, I would so much prefer a parent make a, a burger at home, whole wheat bun. And for the fries, if you buy frozen French fries and you get the big ones like the steak fries, you bake them in the oven, you have a comparable meal. You can also make baked chicken nuggets instead of fry. So you can still always give your children a healthier version at home that's also going to be more economical. And this just goes on to the thing with real food. You know, you, there are certain, you want the food that we eat to be have colors that exist in nature. So if food is, you know, neon, that doesn't, I have not yet discovered the fruit or vegetable that is neon. So um, this just goes into how our food supply has been so, um, so changed. And another thing with um, the going out is portion distortion. Oh, I lost it, I guess, in the transition, but that's a big fries. And um, people want value for their money, so if they're going out to eat, they're given um, big portions, so they'll come back. And they're usually given big portions of inexpensive food. So you could give someone two to three times the amount of French fries that would be a normal size portion because the potatoes are relatively inexpensive. Um, and we've sort of been educated by um, restaurants to how much we should eat. And that's a real problem. So um, another reason why eating out a lot is problematic because you're getting portions that are insanely large. I'd like to say that there's no magic in a bottle. As much as people want to say, you know, their life or they're going to lose all this weight or they're going to be smarter or they're going to be more energetic, that doesn't happen in a bottle. I'm sorry. It happens, the magic really is in food. And in that bowl that that um, young man is holding, it's blueberries. And you, you want better brain function. There's studies that blueberries um, help with this. So, you know, dark colored fruits um, will help with brain function. So the magic really is in the food. And I keep going back to it, but it really, um, I've been, a, as I said, I've been a nutritionist for 30 years. And to be a nutritionist and a registered dietitian, you take chemistry, organic and inorganic chemistry, biochemistry, microbiology. We really have training. It's a pre-med training. So when I first started as a nutritionist, I was so scientific and everything was metabolic pathways and biochemistry and what's in food. And the longer I've been in practice, the more I've gone away from the biochem to food. All people need to understand is eat food. In fact, Michael Pollan, who I mentioned before, his three um, recommendations, which are good ones, are eat food, mostly plants, and not too much. So you can never go wrong eating fresh food, eating a bowl of berries like that. Also about food, and this is super important for children, and this is where we need to compete a little bit with um, the fast food, is make food really taste good and make it fun. The whole message of the fast food um, industry is it's fun here. They have clowns. They have toys. You know, they have all that stuff going on. And parents, we're never going to have the resources that they do, but we can make food a little bit more fun. If you're packing your child's lunch, um, and this is easy. It's um, not going to make anyone gain weight. Put a little note in there. I love you. I hope you're having a good day. Um, can't wait to see you when you get home. But putting, you know, that makes it a little bit more fun. Or putting in surprising a child in their lunchbox with a sticker. Something. We can make food fun. You know, making faces um, a breakfast. Let's say it was a breakfast omelet. And you put strawberry eyes and a little bell pepper mouth. You know, make it fun for a child. And, know, you know, letting children know that real food, tasty food, is still a fun meal. And that's a very important thing to keep um, in mind with a child. There's one, um, I call it ants on a log, that we do in some of our um, school programs. You know, you take a piece of celery, and you can put in there either peanut butter 
or um, like a low-fat cream cheese and put little raisins on top and you have little ants crawling along, you know, ants on a log. But children respond to fun. They don't respond to eat this because it's good for you. That, you know, by the way, adults don't respond to that that well either. So, but we respond to good taste and we respond to good times. Oh, goodness, sorry. This is the family of the 50s sitting around the table. Um, and this is our family today. And times have changed, but the concept of eating together as a family, the benefits of that never changes. So again, real food was a very important um, message that I keep sort of going back to. And eating at a table with the family another important message. And you know, that family meal is definitely not during the week when kids are going to school, but maybe the family meal is breakfast on a weekend. And that's a fun one. You know, the kids could help with the, because there's more time on a weekend for some families. And the kids could help more with preparation. Um, you know, kids are naturals in the kitchen. Um, they love to cook. And even for the youngest of child, pouring and stirring or maybe counting out um, uh, ingredients. These are all fun things. And when you cook something, you're more likely to um, eat them. Uh, this is a personal story. Um, my husband does not eat as much vegetables as I wish he did. But um, my husband um, is retired, so he makes my, my, a salad. I take my lunch to work. So he makes my salad every morning that I can take to work. And he won't eat a salad himself, but he tastes everything as he puts it, as he's preparing my salad. So having him cook or prepare for me is a way for me to get him to eat more vegetables. So when you're touching the food and doing the preparation, it's like you almost can't help but eat the food. These are just, I think, very interesting. And these are from big people in the world of food. And this is, you see the top one, Miriam Weinstein. If we want our kids to lead healthier lives, we should eat with them more often. She's a food critic, as is Ruth Reichel, another food critic. She says, I don't think there is one thing more important you can do for your kids than have family dinner. And the last quote I really love, it's from Michael Pollan, who I've been quoting. And people say they don't have time to cook. Yet in the last few years, everyone has found an extra two hours a day for the internet. So for everyone who can't find time to cook, close the computer and don't go online. It's really a matter of priorities. Um, one thing, another uh, piece of advice I give a lot of my clients is to get a slow cooker, crock pot slow cooker. And with that, you could you just, you know, depending, some recipes are more complex, but there are recipes where you just put all the ingredients in the cooker, you put the lid on, you turn it on slow, low for eight hours, you come home, the house smells fabulous. It smells like someone's been there cooking for you all day and the meal is ready. And always the, the great thing about using the slow cooker is it makes big portions, it makes a, a lot. So for a family, they could have dinner and then their leftovers could be frozen to use at another time. So there are always ways to work around the time issue. <clears throat> it does take pre-planning, and it might take a little bit of research, and the slow cooker costs about $25. But there are ways around the time, that barrier I mentioned of time constraints to have families eating healthier. And as I mentioned already, is cooking kids. I mean, I would watch that knife is a little close to that boy's hand, so in your kitchen be a little bit more careful. But kids are great for stirring and counting and pouring, and they love it, and they're going to be more likely to eat the healthier foods. Growing, it's just a natural, and it could be very basic. You could just buy herbs at the supermarket now and grow those. You can put um, a sweet potato or avocado in water and watch the sprouts. Or another really healthy thing is to, to use sprouts to buy alfalfa seeds or um, beans or even broccoli seeds and sprout them. And those are really super on a salad. But kids are definitely, and, and now a lot of schools are having garden programs because there's research that shows when kids are growing in the garden, 
be strawberries, it could be carrots, they're going to be eating those foods. There's even a lot of, um, for people who live in the apartments, there's ways to even grow small tomatoes. So depending on where in the country you live and what your growing season is, I'm in Miami, so right now we're in the middle of our growing season. I, my backyard's so shady, the thing I grow the best is kale. Luckily, I love kale, um, but I can only grow greens, which is a good thing. Um, so growing anything, even if it's a potted herb that the child could then add to a favorite dish, is a way to get kids more engaged in food. And then just color, you know, color a rainbow. And again, this is a natural for kids. The beauty of fruits and vegetables. I talked about making faces, you know, making designs. I, um, oh, before Thanksgiving, I was getting hundreds of emails of people who made a, a turkey out of uh, a turkey out of all fruits and vegetables. You know, just the like artwork. So this is such a nat excuse me. This is such a natural for children the colors of fruits and vegetables, and to have fun. Remember I said children eat food that is fun and tasty, and colorful foods are natural. Oops. Well, so the bottom line here is real food, mindfulness, paying attention. We do that by um, sitting at a table, not sitting in front of the computer or TV. Cooking with kids is a great way to have your children taste more things that maybe normally that they wouldn't. Gardens and farmers markets, these are all natural, these are all techniques to get children more engaged in eating real foods and getting away from either fast foods, box foods, or highly processed foods. And dinner conversations, just the most wonderful way to create those family memories. And I have a little box of, it's called conversation starters. And it's things that um, kids can ask their parents or parents um, can ask their kids. So on the first day of school, instead of saying, how was school? And hearing your child say, fine, parent can say, I remember my first day of school. This is what I wore, or I was afraid, or this is who I spoke to and try to bring in a, a bit more meaningful conversations. Now these are a few hot topics and we have about 20 minutes left and I was going to review some of um, hot topics today and um, how you, these are things that you might have thought about or you've heard people talking about and just give some clarity. And I'm going to start with gluten free. Now in the past um, people who would eat a gluten-free diet were people who had celiac disease. And celiac is an autoimmune disease. It's a small number of people. And so we, we barely even heard about gluten-free. And again, at the beginning of my practice, gluten-free foods were absolutely horrible because it was such a small population that the manufacturers weren't putting um, energy into making them taste good. And the one thing I remember, which was just horrifying, I had someone who wanted gluten-free bread. <clears throat> Again, this is 30 years ago. And it came in a can, in a can. And it was round. And when you pushed it out of the can, it had these ripples on it like a gelled cranberry sauce did. And it was just hard as a rock. And now, with so many people, um, so gluten-free is still a small percentage of the population. But what we're seeing now is more people with gluten sensitivity. And it might be up to 7% 7 of, 7 to 10% of people have a sensitivity to gluten. And the difference between that and celiac disease, if you have celiac disease and you eat gluten, you damage your small intestine. You also can get um, severe malnutrition, um, iron deficiency anemia, there are rashes associated with it, chronic and severe diarrhea. People with gluten sensitivity, it's a whole range of symptoms. It could just be um, vague uh, stomach problems. It could be some diarrhea. It could be a lot of vague symptoms. And the reason that some researchers believe that there could be a rise in people, I, it could be with the gluten sensitivity, there is more identification of the problem. Or there's also been changes in wheat. Um, the wheat that we... Um, used 
or ate 100 years ago is not the same wheat that we eat today. And um, the wheat has been bred to make higher yields, to make it a softer product. There are things that have been done with breeding that have changed. And some researchers believe that people have a bit of a problem um, digesting gluten. As I said, it could be 7% of the population. Now, or it could be that we just eat so much of it. So maybe someone doesn't have a problem eating two pieces of bread, a sandwich a day. I work with kids who are eating cereal for breakfast, eating cereal for snack when they come home from school, eating cereal for snack before they go to bed, having a sandwich. They might be having 10 to 12 servings of uh, wheat, which is where we find most of the gluten a day. So that might be the problem is just excessive quantities. So if someone suspects that gluten is a problem, um, the simplest way to find out is to take it out of the diet and see if you feel better. For most people, it isn't a problem. Remember, if I say that it's a problem for up to 7% of the population, that means it's not a problem for 93% of the population. So it's a very hot topic. I would suggest if someone is having some of these vague, or you or your child is having these vague symptoms, you should go see a registered dietitian and discuss the diet. Because it could also be things, very nutritious things, that are missing from the diet if someone is eating 10 to 15 servings of wheat or grain or bread or cereal or crackers a day. It might not be the gluten sensitivity, but it might be nutritious things that are missing from the diet. So the benefits if someone truly does have a gluten sensitivity and they stop eating gluten, they will feel better. For a child with a child with celiac disease, it will save their life. Now, casein and gluten-free diet is something that um, many parents of children who are on the autism spectrum hear about, read about, wonder about. And um, is this a useful recommendation for children on the spectrum? And it, there is not an easy answer to this. I have absolutely work with children who are on this diet who parents believe have benefited. I think what's really important about this is age and starting a child. If a parent makes a decision, I think parents are in charge. You know, parents go to professionals for um, professionals can help a parent understand the research on a topic, what is known, give guidance, but it's always up to the parent to decide particularly with a diet that is um, takes, takes some work and is somewhat different than the typical way of feeding a child <clears throat> to decide whether this is a benefit. Um, but again, the younger a child is when they're started on any type of restricted or diet, the easier it is for the child and for the family. And I've worked with children who, um, in addition to children on the autism spectrum, I've worked with children with very rare metabolic disorders that have to drink a very um, strong tasting formula and have to eat an extremely restricted diet. And when these children start on the diet at birth, because these disorders are identified at birth, it becomes natural to them and they accept it and they do very well. If you have to start a child on a restrictive diet at four, five, six years of age, it could be troubling. It could be difficult. So I think when you're thinking about a casein and gluten-free diet, one, look at the child's age to see potential benefit, but also the potential downside is if you have a child and their favorite foods are pastas and breads and they are eating a lot of grains, which is the source of gluten, then... Um, what would be the potential behaviors that would be um, come out of taking away someone's favorite foods? I think it's much easier to restrict casein, and casein is found primarily in milk and dairy products. There are so many good and very tasty milk substitutes out there, whether it's uh, almond milk or rice milk or um, soy milk. So, I, and there's... Um, non-dairy cheeses, there's non-dairy yogurt. So I think eliminating casein is much easier because there are good, you know, milk substitutes 
the gluten can become more troubling, but you really have to look at the age of a child. I think what was a very, though, very um, telling piece of research was done at the University of Florida a few years ago by elders in the in group. And they put children with autism on a casein gluten-free diet, and they gave, um, and it was a blinded, the teachers were blind to the study condition. And they gave teachers a, a checklist um, whether there was any difference in the behaviors. And when the, it was a small study, and at the end of the study, there was no statistical difference in the child's behavior at school, whether they were on or off the casein and gluten-free diet. No statistical difference. But the parents felt and saw, observed a difference. And the parents elected, it was seven out of nine parents elected to keep their children on the casein gluten-free diet. So that's why I mean it's always a parent's decision. And even though the research at this in this particular study didn't see a change for their children, the parents elected to keep their children on the diet. If that is the case, I also strongly suggest that those families see a registered dietitian to make sure the diet is providing everything that the child needs. It's not just about eliminating food. It's also making sure that the good foods are part of the diet. Um, so this is what the registered dietitian would do, is take a history, also looking at the child. If a child has a history of a lot of GI problems, then you would think more. Perhaps there's an issue in the gut if a child um, that might lean towards making a decision pro towards casein gluten-free. And as I said before, looking at current eating habits and looking at compliance issues, and also, I don't know if I have it here, economic issues. <clears throat> because some of the gluten-free products, if you need to replace the pastas or the breads, because that's a big part of a child's intake, then it is a, it is a bit more expensive. And as I said, see a registered dietitian to make sure all the good stuff is in the diet. It's never all about what you take out. Pre and probiotics. <clears throat> our, um, our gut is called the second brain. And more and more research is being done on our gut, our large intestine. And the human body contains 10 times more microbial cells than human cells. We are almost walking bacteria. So you really want to be walking good bacteria. And now I think most people have become familiar with um, good bacteria for the commercials for a certain kind of yogurt, Activia. Um, but it is so important that we populate our gut with good bacteria. It improves absorption of vitamins. It um, improves immunity. It, um, it just changes our whole GI um, digestion and absorption. So, and also, there was really fascinating research about a month ago, a month or two ago, showing that it isn't that we're upset and then our stomach gets upset. If our stomach, it's a two-way street. It isn't just that our brain sends messages to our gut. Our gut sends messages to our brain. So most of us have heard the term gut, you know, my gut tells me not to do that. But people have said that, but they didn't realize they were really thinking with their second brain. So sometimes if our gut is upset, it changes our mood dramatically, and it, it all starts in our gut. <clears throat> so what's really important, oh, the SAG diet is, uh, it stands for the standard American diet, and that's sort of the fast food diet that I've been, you know, a little bit negative about and the processed foods. But the SAG diet is low in good bacteria promoting fiber. So where do we, how do we grow more of these good bacteria? And that's what's called prebiotic foods. Onion, leek, garlic. Sometimes those aren't kid favorites, but bananas are. Wheat bran, which again, remember I said with the gluten-free diet, we have to make sure we're not eliminating things that are important. That would be one. So eating a diet that's very high in fibers and vegetables, you are giving your good bacteria nourishment. It's helping, you know, you are nourishing the bacteria that are going to help your body run better. And uh, let me go back. Probiotics, um, 
let me just say a word. I do recommend probiotics, which are in pill form you can get in a um, drug store, what people call a health food store. I call every food, every food store to me is a health food store if you buy the right foods. But um, this might be important after a child takes antibiotics because antibiotics wipe out the good bacteria. Um, so more attention to the gut. It's, it's a big area of research now. This is also now, is sugar the devil? Some people would say, I think sugar is nutritionally worthless. It is just calories, has no vitamins, no minerals, but it's not poison. Children will not, and adults will not die if they eat sugar, but it's not necessary for survival. And this is such a big topic. I mean, I think a, a great gift to give children is teaching them, you know, the highly sugared foods might be an occasional snack. It's not every day that they need a sugary dessert, they need a sugary snack. Because if you're getting 150 calories, let's say, from a sugary snack, it's probably not got a lot of vitamins and minerals in it, you're missing out 150 calories of a nutritious vitamin and mineral filled snack. So um, sugar, it's hard. And it's with, what's really important with sugar, it's a comfort level that the family agrees on. I, I hear a lot of families come into me and say, oh yeah, I have candies and cookies, but I don't let little Johnny eat it. Well, that's, um, first of all, little Johnny knows where they are and little Johnny is eating them. But it's also singling out little Johnny as different than the rest of the family. And what I think is important is to have a healthy food environment have everything in that house be something that little Johnny can eat, big Johnny can eat, mom, dad, everyone can eat. So having a food environment where those healthy snacks are front and center, and it's not that Johnny's choosing between, um, you know, carrots and hummus or chips. Little Johnny's choosing between carrots and hummus or apples and peanut butter. So the choice is between two healthy foods, not between a fruit and vegetable, and a fried food. So a home food environment where the sugared snacks aren't there, but maybe family goes out for ice cream, or maybe ice cream is bought on the weekends. But it's learning how to, that it's not the majority of the food that's eaten, that it is something, it's an occasional food. This is um, something that was originally proposed by someone named Ellen Satter, who's a social worker and a registered dietitian, calling it the division of responsibility about food, feeding and food with children and families. The parent is responsible for serving nutritious, tasty, and attractive food. And I've been talking about that, especially for kids, you know, fun and looks good on the plate and, and tasting good. And that's a parent's responsibility to put that food out there for a child. The child can't shop or for themselves. They can't do all the cooking that they might need. So it's putting it out there for a child. And it's the child is responsible to eat or not eat. So if a child says, I don't feel like eating now, the parent has to, if the parent accepts that, what we're trying to have people do, children and adults, is to start getting back in touch with the internal feeling of fullness and hunger. And a lot of people, and I, I talked earlier about obesity, and a lot of people have this um, problem with overeating because as children they were told to finish everything on the plate. I work with adults also, and I hear that from so many adults saying that they were always told to finish what's on their plate and they feel bad leaving food. And I don't think people should leave food either. Um, the economy, and you know, you don't want to waste money, but you put less on the plate. And the same with the child, put less on the plate and let the child know they can have more if they want it. And I say the same thing for a child who's overweight. Let them know they can eat and, if, and they have to say if they still feel hunger, they can have more food. Getting children and adults back to identifying hunger and fullness is the best way, one of the best tools we can have to help start dealing with the obesity crisis. Oops. <clears throat> Having a little trouble. Okay. This is the, there's no more food guide pyramid. A lot of people know the food guide pyramid. It's the plate. 
and choosemyplay.gov is a great, great website to get a lot of information for parents. They give meal plans, they give, there's a whole section for kids and kid activities to get them engaged in healthier foods, but it's also a super visual because if you look at this plate, it's half fruits and vegetables. And that's sort of the, um, the image of what we should be eating. Half of what everyone should be eating is fruits and vegetables. So we look at the plate and it's half fruits and vegetables, it's a quarter protein and a quarter grains. And instead of that round thing, which would be a glass of milk, I think it should be a glass of water myself. And a child should have about two to three servings of a calcium rich food. It could be milk, it could be soy, it could be a glass of almond milk or rice milk or coconut milk. A calcium rich food is what's important. But just remember the visual of my plate and that half of that is fruit and vegetables and half of everything we eat should be fruits and vegetables because that's the way to decrease risk of diabetes, heart disease, cancer. That's where the food is the medicine. And that is it. And thank you. And I've been very happy to share this hour with you and I hope that you've gotten some useful information. Bye-bye.